I totally I will be recording on my end um but yeah yeah you get a nasty gram if you don't record ah oh, <laughs> good thing we caught that <laughs> yeah Awesome. Uh, well, thank you guys so much for coming today. This is Project Caldera, and um, we are team number 112 in the Spaceport America Cup this year, and we are representing UC Berkeley. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for your time and being here with us today. So just to give a quick agenda of what we plan on going through, we can definitely change this up as uh, far as you would like to, uh, what you would like to focus on and what you would like to see. But we're going to be starting off with a full team over for overview, then going into our airframe, recovery, payload, avionics, and air brakes teams. Um, and also kind of like moving forward, what particular repairs and steps we plan on doing between now and competition. Um, basically like what's left for us to fly. Um, but yeah, without further ado, starting off with our full team info. Um, this is a quick vehicle overview. Um, we are a two-stage vehicle flying to 30,000 feet. Our current predicted apogee is 30,160 feet or 167 feet, um, something around there. And um, once we kind of like break our vehicle down, we can see our upper stage starts off with our um, nose cone. Joe, if you want to point it out as well on the other video, uh, we have our nose cone. Um, our payload and camera mounts tube. And then we go into our recovery coupler, which sits between our payload tube and our air brakes tube, um, which is kind of shown and marked out as Joe is showing in our vehicle over there. Um, moving down past our recovery tube, we have our air brakes tube, and then that um, fastens on to our fin can or bo booster tube um, at the bottom of the first stage. So after our um, after our fin can over there, we have our stage separation mechanism, which is this white tube you see over here, um, and that is our separation of our stages. And then moving past our stage separation mechanism, we have our recovery section, like coupler section, which houses our recovery for our booster um, stage of our vehicle. And the booster stage of the vehicle is that huge mass of blue um, tube over there. Our, our motor is quite large, so it takes up most of the volume um, over there as well. Um, and uh, we are running off of an O5500 in our uh, booster stage and an M1939 <laughs> motor in our sustainer um, stage of our vehicle. So that's just a quick overview, um, kind of going into our recovery architecture, our general COTS, uh, it's, it's a general COTS system, um, which is a single side dual deploy system, which has two avionics bays, one in each stage. Um, our uh, both of them are axial avionics bays, and they both both stages feature GPSs, a tender descender recovery system, which we'll go into depth and show you a physical representation of, as well as deployment videos. Um, and yeah, um, it's we thought a lot about the wiring, and Daniel over here helps lead our kind of like wiring sections of the team. So uh, moving forward, just to kind of. Uh, let you guys know about what big picture testing um, we've done across the team. We have com uh, conducted two test launches of this physical vehicle over here, as well as two prototype test launches of another uh, vehicle that is kind of like a prototype of this. Um, we have conducted a lot of component testing throughout our vehicle with stress testing, tensile strength uh, uh, testing, as well as electronics testing, and many other forms of testing on each component of our vehicle. So um, to kind of get to like a really strong confidence level that everything here will work. Um, so our test launch one of our vehicle only was our sustainer. So we did not have our lower stage of our vehicle or our stage separation mechanism. It was just to test that all of the, that worked. Um, and we had no damage to the airframe. It went fairly smoothly. However, we did have early deployment of the main chute um, on the recovery side. And we actively worked to combat this in our full test launch as well. Um, we reached an apogee of 8,966 feet of just our sustainer running off of an M1939 motor. Um, we had payload, air brakes, and SRAD avionics um, installed. However, um, they were not at full functionality during this test launch. 
Um, and our second test launch happened on April 27th. It was a partially successful test launch of the full vehicle, and it gave us a lot of insights on what exactly to work on moving forward. There was minor damage to the airframe, which we'll show you visual um, like proof of and kind of talk through our repairs as well that we need to do. There was um, a minor zippering um, that was faced on our booster stage because of um, early deployment um, because the staging essentially broke our pressure shield, um, causing significant damage to our booster recovery system. So, um, mm -hmm. oh, uh, would you like to expand on that then as well? Like what happened? Uh, the staging, the staging was being much broke. Yeah. Um. So it was, but basically, our vehicle when it was staging. Um. Oh, there's another person here. Sorry. I know she's not in the view right now. Um. But we staged at a speed that essentially broke our air pressure shield. Um. That was protecting our recovery system. Um, so there was significant damage. Um. There was also discontinuous ignition wiring. Um. Which where uh, ignition was not triggered in our sustainer. Later on, um, we did lose some materials um, and face damage over there, but um, we do plan on rebuilding and we don't see it being significant enough that we cannot attend competition this year. Um, and the apogee of that, uh, because the sustainer did not ignite was 12,800 91 feet. Um, we did have working air brakes on the system. However, we did not get, get data to prove that it was working, um, but we did not have a fully functional SRAD avionics or payload team. So um, that was a mouthful. Um, so I just wanted to pause here super quickly uh, to see if you guys had any questions on, I guess, um, this. We will be going into depth over a lot of these topics. I just had one question. I mean, what is the pressure shield? I mean, I take that that that's um, sort of the, the nose cone for the booster um, below the motors or something. Is, is that what broke? Uh, it is in that location. So we have our avionic, our booster stage avionics bay right below where it separates between the two stages. So we have a shield between them to prevent um, when it does stage and it's exp exposed to the airstream, we don't want that to mess with the barometers on our altimeters. So we have a shield there. And it's now going to be made out of uh, eighth inch aluminum. Okay. Did, did it fail because of a separation charge or what caused the cause? No, it, it, was, it was originally made out of acrylic, which is a very brittle material. That was just a bad material choice. Okay. Yeah, so that essentially just like shattered um, in our test flight. Um, if are there any other further questions I can answer before we move on to airframe? I'd say keep going. Okay, sounds good. Um, so moving into the airframe. Um, uh, section of our team. Uh, we are currently flying off an O5500 motor in our lower stage and an M1939 motor in our upper stage. Um, and we, this apogee currently listed is incorrect. Um, we plan on flying to uh, 30,107 feet. Um, so that should be edited, but um, hopefully um, we have air brakes deploying at the very, very end. Uh, we don't expect it to deploy um, for a long time. So it would just be for like one second at the end um, We it, from our simulations, which I'll get into later. Um, but this is kind of where we want to be as well. So um, moving forward into our rocket tubing, our uh, everything is COTS. Um, fiberglass wound, filament wound um, tubing that we've purchased from Madco. Um, our nose cone is from Wildman though, I think, um, but almost our full vehicle is from Madco. Um, and the outer diameter of our rocket tubing is 6.17 inches of our body tube and the inner diameter is six inches of our body tube. The total length of our rocket, including our nose cone is 185 inches um, and uh, yeah, we've 
um, it's successfully flown uh, two flights with our sustainer and one flight with our full vehicle. So we're fairly confident in our airframe. What did the total weight end up at? Um, I think Matthew and Steven have figures on the total weight currently. Um, we could pull it up in the report. I think it's around 130 pounds with uh, okay. wet, wet mats. Right. Yeah. Uh, moving forward, we have. Do you want the Do you want the mass? Uh, okay, so if you want the mass with no motor, it's currently set to be ninety one point five pounds, and with the motors, it's one forty eight pounds. One forty eight. Forty eight. Okay. Cool. Uh, moving forward into our couplers, um, we have. Uh, essentially most of the couplers on our vehicle are either like six inch on either side or nine inches on areas where we foresee more uh, bending stress. Um, Stephen and Matthew, would you guys want to talk through our coupler choices? Yeah, so the, the coupler that's joining our, uh, our payload tube and our air brakes tube, it extends nine inches into the payload tube and then six inches into the air brakes tube. And then uh, the coupler that's joining the air brakes tube and the booster tube, that's going six inches into the air brakes tube, and then it spans the entire length of the booster tube, so 20 inches. And then that same coupler sticks out six inches below the uh, booster tube of the sustainer stage, and that couples to the uh, booster stage avionics tube, and that goes six inches into that. And then there's another coupler, coupler coupling that avionics tube to the uh, booster stage booster tube, and that goes six inches into the avionics tube and then nine inches into the booster tube. And there's also an, an additional coupler. Uh, I forgot it out of here, but it's coupling the booster tube and a booster tube extension, but it's permanently attached on. And it just goes between the uh, booster tube extension and the booster tube. Okay, do, do you have an exploded view of the rocket at some point? Um, I didn't. I didn't quite follow where all the couplers went and how they face. And um, we can either do that from a drawing, or we can do it from the actual rocket if it's coming. Yeah. Um. This is probably the best full view of our rocket. Um. If not, we can just kind of point it out through our vehicle right now, if you'd like. The ovals point like where there's screws and the triangles point where they're shear pins. Okay, so if I, if I started on this, I would see that it looks like you've got the coupler for the nose cone screwed in. Yeah. Uh, and then- And that's six inches on either side, yeah. Okay, and then it looks like there's a bulkhead there. Is, is that the bulkhead for the cone basically? Yeah, so we have an internal nose cone bulkhead. Um, there's also another person on call right now, Joe. He has a camera that's going to be showing the actual vehicle on the side as well. So um, uh, the internal bulkhead on the nose cone is to align our payload as well as place ballast um, on our vehicle. Okay, and, and so the yeah, your payload is in the cone. Yes, over oh, here. Okay. Yeah. And then this uh, coupler over here extends six inches here and six inches on this side um, into our payload tube. And, um, okay, I see you're talking about shear pins here. Mm -hmm. uh, so at, at, at this location, that first location was shear pins. Um, is that the uh, four number six? Shear pins at that's at that location. Yeah. Uh, you can see it live on the video as well um, that Joe is showing. Yeah, I'm I'm having difficulty seeing both screens at once. So okay. I'm, I'm mainly just looking at the presentation at this point, and uh, you know, I'll we'll have to go back for the rocket because I can't see them well at the same time. Totally understand. Yeah. Okay, so uh, 
point out to me then uh, where the separation is. Is it, is it just at the one location? Um, we have a separation in one location on our uh, sustainer stage, which is um, over here and a separation on one location in our booster stage, which is over here. And obviously our stages separate as well. Um, but overall, there's essentially like three separation points. We're using single side dual deploy. Yeah, and then, then you've got, uh, I think that it's like the air brakes module is connected with screws. Yeah. Okay. And and one one question I was going to ask you on the air brakes section because uh, so much of the tube is cut out. Um, mm -hmm. Is that where you are? You doubling that area with the coupler? Yes. So we actually faced this exact same issue of competition last year with the air brakes mechanism. So uh, our air brakes mechanism ended up shearing at competition last time, um, and this time essentially what we have is a body tube with a coupler tube permanently epoxied inside of the body tube. So it's doubled up on tube in the area where their flaps cut out. Um, the flaps are also rounded and on the inside, like the coupler extends a little bit more. Um, so like there's essentially like, it's it's doubled up on tube. Um, yeah. Got it, okay. Um, yeah, this is another uh, kind of diagram of what the doubled up looks like, but um, hopefully that's that makes sense. We can go back to our airframe section. Uh, moving forward, we have um, fins made out of G10 sheet fiberglass on both stages. Um, they are... Um, through the wall mounted onto our motor mount tube and secured on either side with centering rings on both stages. Um, and on the uh, upper stage, we have five layer fin glassing tip to tip. And on the <laughs> lower stage, we have three layer fin glassing tip to tip. Um, and we have a factor of safety uh, just by doing fin flutter calcs on this on the upper stage of 1.72 and on the lower stage of 1.65. Um, but like both are glassed and um, extra filleted to like make up for that, uh, if that makes sense. And they are also airfoiled um, with a hexagonal airfoil. Uh, what, what, what does that mean? Is that different from just beveling? I mean, is it actually airfoiled the entire length? Um, it is um, airfoiled the entire length, yes. Okay, and and at the thickest point, what's the thickness or before? Well, um, I'm not sure with the glassing, um, but maybe what I want to know is the thickness before you glassed it and the final thickness. Um, Matthew and Stephen, do you guys know these numbers? Um, it's quarter inch before glassing. Um, after glassing, we can quickly measure that for you right now. Um, I don't think we took the details on that. Last time I recall it was one sixteen, but I might be wrong. It's zero point two nine inches. So it was zero point two five inches before glassing. Is zero point two nine inches after glassing? Um, we do have paint on the vehicle currently, um, but it should be negligible from what okay. we've seen. Now, when when I was. Looking at the height, okay, I, I thought I saw a, a little, even a little higher height than the, than the open rocket. I may, I may be wrong, but you, uh, you have a currently you have a height on the, is that the sustainer or the booster we're looking at? Um, or, or to here is the sustainer. Here to here is our booster. So this is our full vehicle behind us currently. Okay, it, it's kind of rare to see fin heights that are that are actually above the caliber of the rocket. Most most teams are 
shorter than they should be. Yeah, we expected some weight differences in our vehicle, so we chose a more conservative fin design. Okay, that says uh, airfoil three quarters of an inch. What does that mean? Um, the airfoil extends uh, three quarters of an inch in to create a hexagonal airfoil um, okay. base on the. Okay, I got it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, this is just kind of talking through again. Um, we also did some fin flex, fin flex strength testing. However, those test articles were minimum diameter fin mounted. Um, this was much earlier in the year with our other uh, team. So uh, we did test kind of like our fin glassing methods, how much strength it adds to our fins um, and stuff like that. However, we did not uh, gain super valuable data from that um, other than it was stronger. Um, it was just hard to gain quantitative data from that, um, if that makes sense. Um, are there any questions on this slide? Um, on, on the through the wall, um... Do you have motor tubes inside the airframe for the two motors? Yes. Okay, and so when when you did the through the wall, um, where where did you put fillets, and then and the, and then I guess you glassed over that, but you you did fillets to that motor tube. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So everything is sanded down for prep and then Joe can talk through that as well. Yeah, so internally there's half inch fillets uh, going from the fin to the motor mount tube and then the fin to the bo body tube on the inside. And on the outside, it's an inch and a half fillets. The inch and the inch and a half are like the radius yeah, of sorry. our fillets, yeah. And it's also epoxied um, on the flat side of the fin to the motor mount tube. I'm sorry, say that last thing again. So when we saw that we put epoxy on the fin and we uh, like tack it, it on yeah, onto yeah. the motor mount tube, and then we did the fillets to the motor mount tube, the body tube, and then outside on the body tube. Okay. All right. Yeah. All our internal fillets were half inch. Our external fillets were one and a half inches radius. Okay. That's, that's another thing that's sort of uncommon to actually have a, a fillet that's the right size. Yeah, we conducted like testing and did analysis on um, what exact fillet radiuses would be best for our vehicle and where we would actually see um, like a return on the amount of epoxy or like radius we're using versus not really um, the just like adding more epoxy that might not do much in that sense. So, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So I have a quick question. Do the uh, fin slots in the uh, body tubes extend all the way to the aft end of the body tubes? No, it's just the length of the fin. Okay, so you had to somehow get in there to apply those fillets. Yeah, we had a very long uh, fillet tool. <laughs> yeah, it was basically okay. a long stick with yeah. a scraper on the end. Yeah, I'm familiar with that. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, uh, moving forward into our nose cone design, if there are no further questions, um, we are currently using a five to one Von Karman fiberglass wound nose cone, which we purchased from Wildman, I think. Um, and after simulation, we just we determined that this was the best for us, as well as um, it gave us um, enough space to house our payload in as well. Um, the dimensions are here. The shoulder length on this slide is incorrect. It should be six inches and not nine inches. Um, but yeah. Are there any questions on this? Nope. Um, something to note is um, in our test flights, um, we both of our test flights, we experienced the nose cone tip falling off on um, impact or becoming loose in that sense. So uh, we're trying to find a better way to maybe like more it rigorously mount it on or install it but we understand that it just kind of happens with um landing on test flights so yeah um we quickly talked through 
I guess, our fastener locations and choices. But um, to kind of go into it a little further, our whole vehicle uses M5 screws, um, and these are stainless steel, and they are six um, M5 screws that are diagonally offset. So um, everything is like slightly diagonally offset from each other um, on every single side. Um, and the air brakes tube is has 12 with uh, three sets of four um, for easy. Uh, so, oh yeah, sorry, that's 24. So on both sides, so each side has 12 on both sides of the air brakes tube. So the air brakes tube is kind of like the only um, area where we're not do using the six diagonally offset. Um, and the um, on the other side, we have these adhesive nuts that are curved to the curvature of our tube. So they epoxy to, to the cur like inside curvature of our tube and um, our screws just screw in. Um, and at our non-fixed points, we use um, four 632 nylon screws in that sense. We conducted a lot of like separation tests, sorry, uh, compression testing um, using different fastener layouts, such as having parallel offsets versus like um, diagonally offset. And we determined diagonal offset was the best for us. And we actually went back in and glassed over every region that we drill into our tube um, with the fasteners and shear pins to ensure that those areas did not experience any delamination and remain structurally sound throughout multiple test flights. Um, is there, are there any questions on this particular portion? No. Oh, moving forward. Joe here can talk about our camera. Hi. So we have uh, three Insta360 GO3 cameras mounted uh, inside the body. Um, they're partially inside and they stick out a little bit. So they're angled like that. Um, they're inserted from the inside. And um, so the mounts are 3D printed from um, chopped carbon fiber, nylon filament on the Mark Forge. Then the outside shroud that makes it aerodynamic, um, that's a four to one Von Karman. Uh, shape and that's also glassed over um yeah so they're um they're actually beefier than they need to be it, it landed directly on the camera on the last test flight and everything's intact that worked out well um moving forward to our rail buttons um we have a diagram here that kind of marks out exactly where our rail buttons are located we have four rail buttons um, on our vehicle, um, they're meant for a 1515 rail, and we have a wooden block epoxied on the inside on the back of where these rail buttons are going into, so we're able to drill into those. Um, they're just standard rail buttons that we purchased off of FG Rocketry. Um, and yeah, any questions? One thing that would concern me a little bit about that is that uh, my recollection is that the, 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 none of the rails we're likely to use are all that straight. <laughs> That's just a fact. Um, and having four of them aligned over that length might be a challenge. We understand. Um, we've test flown this rocket on actually with at far uh friends of amateur rocketry and they said that um one the rails that they have um with them would mimic the rails at spaceport um if is that true um or are there other considerations we could take into account well i i i'm i'm thinking that there might be just a little bit of bend in, in the rails that we likely will end up using. So I would say just be prepared if you had to, to like you might need to remove the top one. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully you would be able to keep the next three. Mm -hmm. um. Also, just to add on that, uh, the four rail buttons is also kind. We, uh, we also chose that because uh, as the rocket is a two stage and we need, and uh, so we put the two stage separated on the rail guide, and so having the two, uh, rail guides ensure that we are that the rocket is like straight on the rail guide. But yeah, if 
if we need to remove one, we uh, we're gonna try to counter that. Okay. Yeah. Well, one one thing that you might just be prepared for if if there's a need. Um, I mean, let let's say that you had to take um, one or even two of the rail buttons off. Because, uh, you know, the, the rails just aren't going to be perfectly straight. Uh, and you don't have a lot of tolerance on the 1515 buttons. Um, you, you might be prepared with a little support to go under the sustainer so that it, you know, kind of holds it off the rail just a little bit. Okay, we can definitely design one in time um, and just like, I don't know, 3D print something or even like a wooden block or something like that. Yeah, I, I just usually use something like a little wooden block. And then once you get it vertical, you just take that out. Um, totally. but, but it kind of keeps it supported in the event that the, the rail button has to be removed. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, because I know that the the, you know, we had two 20 foot rails out there last year and neither one of them was perfect. Uh, and there, there may be another uh, 20 foot rail mounted on a trailer. Um, but I know that one's not perfectly straight either. So I, I just caution you that four might be a challenge to, to get on there without, uh, you know, having a little too much friction. Cool. Thank you. Um... I'll move forward then. Um, talking about our bulkheads. So our bulkheads are machined from 0.25 um, inch aluminum and our removable bulkheads are basically labeled here as RM and our permanent bulkheads are also labeled in here. Um, our bulkheads are installed with, um, fill with fillets that um, kind of vary for each bulkhead based on like how it's mounted. Um, but overall they're filleted on both sides usually. And we went through compression testing with our Instron where we just try to crush it through our tubes. Um, and it was fairly successful and um, went through all our like max loading cases in our scenarios. Um, but anyone else would like to add about our bulkheads and the way they're installed and their testing? Um, it, it's, it sounds like you've done the testing to kind of show that those those are are strong. Mm -hmm. um, one one thing that 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 I just see a lot um, with uh, projects is is the preparation for the tube that the bulkheads go in. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you, you'd normally go through the the you know the typical sanding, and then you know you might clean off the inside of the tube with the uh, uh, alcohol or something like that. Hmm. But the step that's not usually done is, is to do something that, that I refer to it as buttering the tube. Uh, and, and that is, you know, if you if you had a, uh, you know, an area of the tube that was maybe an inch long where you were going to put fillets, uh, you might take your finger and a glove and just wipe epoxy in that area, uh, you know, and, and get it down in there into the scratches where you sand it and so forth. Uh, and then, uh, you know, with a, you know, a very thin layer of epoxy, I guess, you can almost wipe it completely out. But the thing is you get the epoxy down into the scratches so that when you add the fillet, you've got a bond that's, that's strong enough with the tube. Uh, and I'm not sure if I described that pretty well, but I've had a couple teams that, uh, you know, glued in the fillets and then they had a hard landing, and, you know, with, with, you know, probably a half a pound of epoxy for the fillets on there, and yet they just popped right out. And the, 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 the problem is they didn't go through that step where they buttered that joint ahead of time. They just slathered on a bunch of epoxy and, and it doesn't really do very much for holding it on. Yeah. So we, we talked about doing that actually, but most of our bulkheads, they're pretty deep in um, and so we wouldn't be able to do that. I think on the staging rings, though, like they're deep enough or they're like shallow enough in. We did that. So, so like yeah, the... we did them on as many as we could. Um, but some of them were just like hard to access when we were installing. But um, definitely we'll be adding that to our procedures moving forward. Yeah, that's that's the secret. Anytime you glue surfaces together is to butter both surfaces so that you get the full bond. Because mm -hmm. it's hard, particularly if you're using structural epoxy or something, it's very difficult to, 
put in a fillet and 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 get that bond to happen without uh, you know going through and, and doing that particular step. Totally. Yeah. Cool. Um, we quickly just did talk through our pressure shield, but we could also talk through it again if you'd like. Um, it is going to be now an eighth inch aluminum plate. Uh, Laura, would you like to expand? Okay, and and this is located. Well, um, okay, point it out when we look at the view of the rocket next time. I mean, and when we look at the state, the interstage couple, mm -hmm. so that I can see where it goes because I'm not really quite sure. We can show it right now. Yeah, we yeah we currently ha don't have the new. Um, pressure shield with us because um, we just manufactured a new one after our swipe. Um, but Laura can just point it out right now. It goes right here, yes. Mm -hmm. So, in the, so this is our way to set up the face. We need a lot of things that so the AI goes over here, and then the pressure shield goes like right on top of it, on top of the AI. So it would be right here. Um, Oh, okay. Yeah, and this is kind of where our staging mechanism is, um, along with here, and that's our booster stage. So is this pressure shield on the sustainer? No, it's on the booster. It's at the top of the booster. Okay, so it's at the top of the booster, but just below the staging plate. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that, that helps a lot. Okay. Yeah, I'm just having absolutely no luck with these windows. Uh, so, I mean, we'll, 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 we'll have to go back and look at it again after we're done with the presentation. Because I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to switch back and forth from one window to the next, and it's just not possible for some reason. No worries. Um, you can uh, hit the one square next to all the faces. You might have it at multiple squares right now. If you hit one square, um, we can, you can pin our video as well and expand it. Um, if that okay, actually, I just figured out how to do it. <laughs> nice, that's awesome. We could go through it again super quick if you'd like. But um, basically, uh, Laura, if you want to grab the AV, but oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, our AV base sits in here. The pressure shield sits right on top. Um, this is our booster, um, and this is our where our staging room is um, in here and our staging mechanism. And then this is our uh, upper stage. So this all connects. Um, RB, if you wanna, uh, if you wanna like uh, quickly um, refresh the slides, I added a little arrow on the slide to show where exactly the is. Yeah, here. Oh, which slide number is it? Yeah. yeah, this one. Does that make more sense? Um, okay, so I'm looking at this drawing right here um, and at the bottom of this slide. And, and um, yeah, can, can you put your cursor on the slide? I don't know if I can see your cursor when it's moving out. Yes, I can see the cursor. Okay, so start from the fins on the sustainer and work your way down and tell me what each component is. Um, so this or, is our go to the right, yeah. Fins uh, moving down, Laura. Would you want to talk through these components? So, oh, so that's a centering ring, right? Yeah, so, this is our centering ring. So there's a center ring, mm -hmm. upper staging ring, lower staging ring. Pressure so is is the motor hanging out, and that's going to be part of your interstage couple? It sticks out, I think just the closure sticks out. 
Yeah, only the closure of our motor sticks out from here, like past our centering ring. We have photos we could show you as well. Okay, and then what's next? Um, so after um, our centering ring from our motor, we have our upper staging ring and our lower staging ring that facilitates staging. Okay, and is that the explosive bolts? Yes, yeah. And then after that, we have our pressure shield which is over here. Okay. And then we have our avionics bay. Okay, and, and then remind me where the separation point is. So the separation point is, the stages separate here. Okay, and then what about the booster? And the booster will separate here for recovery to deploy. Okay, I'm I'm not seeing your your cursor. Oh um oh I can show it on the cursor. Um so Laura, if you want to also point it out, um these stages will separate here. Right. And our recovery deploys over here. For our booster. Okay, well, where is where does the tube separate? The tube separate here and here. Okay. Um, and and so when the drogue comes out, where does it emerge from? Where does it come from? from the drogue from emerges, emerges from the separation point over here. Okay. So you'll have like a, a harness and, and you'll have just the, the, um, the avionics bay attached on one side. Correct. Okay. All right. Oh. Uh, the so on when when this when recovery separation happens, the main will be closer to the side with the avionics bay. The drogue will be on the other end of the harness. Sorry. Can, can you repeat that once more? You're very quiet. Oh. Um. So so when the when the recovery bay separates. For deployment, the drogue will be on the side furthest from the avionics bay. The main will be close to the avionics bay since we have single side dual deploy. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm not sure I understand that. Oh. It will all be coming out from one separation point. The right. drogue is the drogue chute is located closer to our booster section, while our main chute is located closer to our avionics bay section. But it's just two tubes splitting, but they're both coming from one separation point as we're doing single side dual deploy. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds like, you know, if I just literally take the words you said, that the drogue has to somehow pass by the main uh, yeah. to emerge from the section. Um, kind of, um, yeah, we could show you videos that will probably make a lot more sense than us trying to talk it through as okay. well. Yeah. Okay. And so then we're, what we're looking at there, we've got the plate and then you've got your avionics down below the, below that plate. Yeah, that is correct. Yeah. Okay. And, and so when you deploy the drone, then um, the the drogue is going to come out, but the main is still going to be with the booster section. No, it, the whole harness comes out. The whole harness comes out. The main chute just stays in the bag. Okay, and and so do you have to run wires from the avionics bay to the main? Yes, we do. That's why we want it on the side closer to the av avionics bay, so we don't need to make those wires too long. The wires are taped onto the shot cord with like um some uh to leave enough that it won't break under tension. Okay. Okay, well let's let's go ahead and go on then. So so let me let me uh uh interject here. So the the drogue is aft of the main, but when the booster uh separates at apogee both the drogue and the main are exposed to the airstream, but the main is contained 
within the deployment bag by the tender descenders. That is correct. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's correct, right, Arby? That is correct, yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, we can move forward. Um, our permanent bulkheads, like we just mentioned before, are quarter inch aluminum plates with half inch fillet radiuses. We do have holes in some of our permanent bulkheads as we need them for certain wires or U bolts for recovery bulkheads. And we've done a variety of testing to find like the most optimized attachment technique and are satisfied with our current attachment technique. Um, what, what, what am I looking at there of the black piece? What's that? Uh, those are barrier blocks. We use those to connect our ejection charges to the alt 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 altimeters on the avionics bay. Okay. Um, yeah, but overall, um, just to kind of wrap up our airframe um, section, the um, we've had two test launches of just our sustainer and then our whole vehicle. Um, we've had very, very minor issues with airframe overall, where uh, we've had our nose cone tip falling off um, and like slight damage to the nose cone just below the tip, but it was like just a couple scratches that we could have just, we, we just sanded off and painted over and epoxy the tip back on. Um, we do not have an, we would say an ideal weight scenario um, <laughs> because of, uh, and like we would just prefer stability to be a little bit better um, through our launches, but it's it's fine. Um, but um, currently we are not um, going to kind of do anything about this other than try to play with our payload weight if possible. Um, we did face a small amount of zippering. Um, yeah, but um, in for future vehicles, we might wanna redo our booster stage. Uh, fin span, but we did face a small amount of zippering at the top of our booster tube, which we can show you right now as well, um, which is kind of over here. So this is like the extent of our zippering after we like sanded it down and cleaned it up. It's approximately two inches for reference, 2.5 inches. Um, we plan on just patching it up, essentially. Are there any questions? Um, no, I, I just think we're probably going to need to walk back through a you know a closer view of the rocket after we get through the presentation. Okay. Yeah, I'm just making. Uh, it's really point. hard to see both of them at the same time, so we'll just go back to the rocket after we're after we get through the slides. Totally understand. Cool. Uh, let's move forward to recovery. Laura will be leading us through the recovery section with Daniel and Kush. Um, uh, so yeah, so our recovery system for both stages is single solid dual deploy. And we did this, this, we did this so that we could minimize the number of airframe joints. And so we could eliminate, eliminate the need for additional avionics space, which we would need for two recovery systems, air start, and uh, staging. Uh, and this is done using Tinder, Tinder Rocketry L2 tenor descenders, which retain their main chute in its bag until we reach an altitude of 1,000 feet. And we have, um, we made some custom hooks out of titanium, which allow for parallel arrangement of the tenor tenors, and that allows us redundancy. So if one of them goes off, the whole, the whole thing will, will separate regardless. And we have tested this in two launches so far, both the Caldera launches, and we've done a lot of ground test and pull apart tests to confirm this. Uh, so on the on the right we have our sustainer harness on the top and the booster harness on the bottom. Do we have any questions so far? Um, okay, so sustainer on the top and and um, okay, so where does the nose cone payload hook on to? I can put my cursor on it, so it should be here, correct? Okay, so that goes there. All right. No. So in in this case, your your bundled yeah. ring is going to be closer to the yes, it is the body down. tube and not the nose cone. Yes. But in the case of the booster, it's closer to the interstage coupler. Yes. Okay, so it, it's it's kind of reversed, I guess. It's it is. 
think about it. Yep. And, and okay, so let me just. Okay, and, and were, were you having some difficulty with the tender descenders, the, the, the using the two of them? We did have some difficulties early on in the process trying to confirm that we got actually we had redundancy. I think we figured that out now with the finalized hook design. It it's uh bi-directional, so it's it's entirely symmetrical. If one of them goes, the other one does go. Uh right now, what's the one right now? Um yeah, yeah. Uh right now the main thing that we're trying to improve on is keeping it keeping the main inside its bag during flight. Um during both the previous flights, they did come out earlier than we wanted them to. It's been improving. Uh, but if you have any feedback on that, we would like to ask about that. Yeah, I haven't used them a lot, so I'm I'm not sure that I can give you um, much advice on them. Um, yeah, so you you've got the two tender descenders next to each other, and then you've got basically a cord that you're wrapping around the deployment bag. No, uh, the only thing holding it inside the main is it is a tight fit, and we try to hold it as close to the airframe as airframe as possible, so it's not as exposed to the airstream. Oh, okay. Um, but then I probably don't understand what what is the tender descender holding together. The tender descenders are holding a bypass line close, so that prevents tension from pulling the main out of the bag. So when the tender descenders separate, then the main essentially this, gets yanked out. This chunk of shot cord can come under tension and that pulls the main out of its bag. Okay, and so and and so, what is holding the bag together then? Just a tight fit. Yes. I thought you had an elastic band around the deployment bag that the deployment bag flap was uh, uh, held under. We do. We do also have an elastic band that's holding the flap closed. So we're trying to keep the flap from opening and that hopefully holds onto the main a little bit better. Okay. Yeah, I can imagine it's going to be a little difficult to keep that chute in the bag for the entire descent. Um, I'm not sure what to do to make that more reliable. Okay, well let's let's go on. Totally. Uh, we have seen like improvement between our test flights by making our own deployment bags and like experimenting with um, kind of keeping that main in tighter with elastic bands um, as well. So we do hope to continue improving it with our last um, iteration as well. Yeah, one one thing, I mean, I, I, I have a deployment method that I use on deployment bags and, and I put a couple rubber bands around there to keep the 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 bag contained as best I can, and, and it seems to work. Mm -hmm. um, you know the uh, you know the pilot chute is enough to um, pull those bands. You know, pull the flap down when the time comes. Um, now, if I think about this a little bit on the sustainer, you've got the. Um, well, let's see, you're going to have the drogue and, and pulling against the uh, the heavy airframe to pull that out. And I guess it's going to be the same thing on the booster. So, um, yeah, how, how big is, you know, how, how big are the, the drogue chutes that you're using and what sort of velocity to, do you get to? on those um it should be on our next slide 
So um, our booster do drogue is a 36 inch diameter, our sustainer drogue is a 48 inch diameter. Um, and the altitudes at which they deploy at are represented here um, as well. Let's see the next slide. And the speeds at which they're deployed at are on this slide with our. Hmm. We also have like cases of failure um, that we've walked through um, to ensure that we can make it through that. Okay, that, that looks kind of like maybe it's reversed. Could that possibly be? Um, because you have a higher speed in the nominal than in the case of the air start failure. Um, the air start failure would mean our motor would not go off. Right. So we would be going slower. I think. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if I may speak up, I think that it's possible that one column may be mislabeled. Uh, if the, in the event of an air start failure, a drogue would be deploying at a lower velocity, hypothetically. That could be the source of this confusion. Um, we also what? have more mass when our sustainer goes through an air start failure. So it does make sense. Okay. Uh, okay, I, I think we, yeah, we need to see what sort of the descent rate is under drogue because the those drogue shoots seem kind of large, uh, and I'm surprised to see the velocities of 127 feet per second for those drogues. So I'm not quite sure what I'm, what I'm looking at yet, but. Uh, they are they're ring cell drogues, so they we chose the drogues that that had similar equivalent behavior to a normal elliptical or PDA parachute. Okay. May, maybe um, maybe the issue is that. The velocity that you're citing for the nominal is higher because it's a higher altitude. Yeah, and it's also a lower mass of a vehicle if the motor goes off. So the motor, the propellant weight of the M1939, if it stays in our vehicle, is um, going to be adding a significant amount of weight as well. Yeah, I, I think it might help the clarity of this if you site the descent rate under drogue that is occurring right before the main is deployed. Okay, okay. Um, don't worry about what it is when it first comes out or, you know, those sorts of things. You're only really interested in it uh, at the time when the main gets deployed. We do think these are terminal velocities, but we can double check them and get back to you as well. Okay, yeah, I'm not sure, well, um, Okay, I mean, what I'm seeing though in that table is you've got a sustainer nominal of 126 and a, sustain, a sustainer air start failure of 102, a lower number. And, and if the motor didn't fire, you would expect that to be a higher number, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, we can redo these numbers and get back to, you. yeah. Okay, and the, the reason that it's important mm -hmm. is that when, when, when you release the drogue, or I'm sorry, yeah, when, you, when, you, when your tender descender releases, you're momentarily, your drogue is not gonna be slowing the rocket down anymore. It's gonna be in free fall uh, until such time as, well, at least, at least for a short period of time, while that harness extends and pulls the main out, right? Mm -hmm. So during that time, the rocket will will speed up, and you know a lot of times, and you know when you see videos of test flights with um, you know the single side deployment, you you can actually see the rocket speed up 
uh, at the, you know when the when the release device fires. Mm -hmm. So if you if you got a high velocity at that point, it's it's going to go up from that point, and mm -hmm. so at some point in time, it 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 goes up too high. And so that that's why I say you want to see what the what the um, drogue descent rates are at the point in time when that release takes place. Mm -hmm. um, we had a member just recheck our data for drogue terminal velocity with the air start failure, and it's actually 138 feet per second. So this is incorrect. You were um, you were right. Yeah. Okay, so that's getting kind of fast. I mean, why is that yeah. so fast? Got large drogue shoes. Um, yeah. I think our vehicle is quite heavy. Um, this one. Yeah. Um, it could be the, uh, the, the descent rate on a ring sail is much higher than a standard drug. Yeah, the CD looked pretty low. Um, did choose, that is true. We did choose the lower CD on purpose because we expect very high velocity winds at the altitudes that we're going to be at. And we were worried that a PDA would uh, with, would have too high of a CD and would tear itself apart. So we're hoping that the ring sails would be able to withstand that a little bit better. Well, I wouldn't normally worry too much of, of, uh, if you're talking about withstanding the force uh, of whatever the wind is at 30,000 feet. I mean, that that isn't the thing that is the issue. Um, you know, I mean, certainly you can get more drift if you have, you know, the, you know, a slower descent rate. That was, that was another reason. We also wanted to reduce the drift distance of the sustainer stage since it's going so high. Yeah. Um, yeah, you are you're you're pretty close to being too fast uh, coming down on drogue. Uh, and, you know, if it was just coming down at that rate and then you put out a main, um, that would be one thing. But like I say, the, 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 um, the rocket's going to accelerate for a second or two um, after, after the release device fires. So, you know, that, that, that relatively high velocity is going to get even higher. Now, it's, it's within the rules that, you know, I mean, I think it allows uh, the drone speeds up to 156 feet a second, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you're, you're within the rules. And so I'm not going to say you've got to change it, but I will say if it was my rocket, I'd probably go with a little higher drone or a little larger drone to try to uh, slow that velocity down just a little bit. Okay, we will definitely consider it and have other shoots we can consider in stock as well. So, yeah, because on you know, I mean, you're you're really wanting to shoot for something around ninety to a hundred feet a second. So you're you're pretty high, and you're going to be putting quite a bit of force on on the um, uh, on the uh, mains when they deploy. Mm -hmm. So I I would think about what you're doing on that. Um, so uh, you're using the toroidal shoot, or well, okay, pull down apex. Uh, whose shoots are those? Rudy shoots. It is the toroidal and your parachutes. Okay. Are they the compact or the regular or? They are uh, the booster stages and ultralight. The sustainer stage is a, is a standard. Okay. And I'm trying to now. Let's see. In the um, the deployment bag setup that you have, um, I assume when when the main gets pulled out of the bag, that the harness is attached to the bottom of the shroud lines. 
Yeah. I, don't, I don't know what else you would do. So I'm, I'm what I'm kind of trying to envision is how does the main get pulled out? And the bag is attached to the U-bolt on the airframe, and then the bridle on the parachute is attached to the shock cord in the middle of the shock cord. So then when the tenor descenders release, that section of, sh of shock cord between where the parachute bridle is and the U-bolt, it comes under tension that, that pulls it away from the bag. OK, so is, is that shock cord attached to the uh, shroud lines at the bottom end of the parachute? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so so one of, one of the things that happens when you do it that way is that you're actually opening the parachute up upside down. Uh, if you kind of imagine that it that it's mm -hmm. falling and and I'm thinking of the of the sustainer at the moment. Uh, you know, it's, it's going to release and the, and you're going to start pulling out the shroud lines out of the bag uh, and you know, I mean, it, it could kind of pull out upside down. So I'm just trying to think if, 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 you know, what that means, given the velocity that things are falling. I don't know if I can come up with a rationale to do something differently. Um, You know, I'm, I'm having to think about it because I haven't quite seen this configuration before, so I have to stop and ponder it. Um, no worry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, let 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 let's go on. Um, I, I'm I am a little concerned about the speed at which that's descending. Um, you know, and it, it's sort of a you know, philosophically, it's it's sort of a problem with the head end. Uh, you know, the single opening. You know, you, you say, well, okay, you need to. You're not going to get the benefit of the, you know, the, the rocket coming down in a you know a conventional V shape. It's all going to fall directly under the, the the drogue, and so you have to make the drogue a little bit larger, and then um, you know, in order so that it doesn't fall as fast. So. Yeah, we will definitely take that into consideration moving forward and see if we can like kind of move things around or um, like redo any calcs to ensure that we're in a safe zone for sure. Um, we have had two test flights and um, not huge issues with our deployment of our drogue um, in particular. Okay, so remind me, did you did you actually test this on the sustainer in, the, in, in this way with that? Uh, we had two test flights of this exact configuration. Okay, and then the only thing that might potentially change is if the motor didn't like. Yes. Uh, relative to your test flights. Mm -hmm. But I think one of your test flights, the sustainer motor did not like. Yes, that is true. Yeah. So you've actually tested that situation. Yeah, we've tested the worst case. Uh, situation in that sense. Um, okay. Um, th then you also should have data telling you what the actual descent rate was at the time when the main came out. Oh yeah, that is that is true. Yeah, we can look at that. Can, can you look at that number and then just send me a note and say, okay, on our test flights, here were the velocities that we had when the main came out. Yeah, someone can pull it up on the side right now while we continue through slides, if that's OK. okay. Yeah, because that would be a useful number to have in mind. And, and, I, and I would say that if you did, mm -hmm. did that testing and, 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 and that was successful, that then I wouldn't say you have to change anything, you know, mm -hmm. just in the, the performance. So mm -hmm. um, we just got the number up. It was 130 feet per second. Which wow. is great. yeah, which is not it's a little, it's a little crisp. Yeah, <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> it oh. it did work. Um, but we will definitely look into seeing if there are ways we can like save that part of our system a little more. 
Okay. Um, I was just looking at the uh, the components there. No worries. Let us know when you want us to move forward. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, so, sometimes I tell people to be careful a little bit on the amount of hardware that they're using uh, because it can become a point where things get tangled. And so, you know, I might say on the uh, main shoots, maybe you don't need the swivels. Uh, but given the way that you're doing it and the, the potential issue with the deployment tag, it's probably worth keeping them on there just in case you, you have a main at Apogee or at some point on the, the descent. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go on. Okay, uh, moving forward to our- uh, let, me, let me say, can, can you move back two slides? Oh, okay, totally. That, uh, Don't worry, yeah. Is this yeah. the third you were looking for? Yeah, go back one more. Um, this one? Okay, yeah, we saw them all. Okay, let's go okay. let's go okay. forward then. Okay. Uh, moving forward to the deployment charges section, um, we obviously have primary and redundant charges on our drogue and main for both um kind of sections, but um I guess our main shoot charges are technically our tender to sender uh, block powder charges. Um, these have been definitely like highly tested with ground testing, pull apart um, testing, as well as um, flight flight testing. Um, and would anyone like to add, I guess? We, um, we do have a video of a pull apart test if you'd like to see, as well as ground tests, if you'd like to see that as well. You said a full flight test? Um, yeah, we've done full flight tests with these numbers. We've done ground tests, several ground tests with these numbers. We've done, uh, we can show you videos as well of all of this, um, okay. as well as pull apart tests. Yeah. Okay, so if I'm, if I'm going through here now, the booster drogue, okay, those those uh, charge amounts look reasonable. And then you have the tender to sender. Uh, the sustainer drogue uh, says three times two grams. What does that mean? So we essentially have three, um, two grams of like a high altitude charge um, setup that maybe Laura could talk about for them. Which is this picture on the top right here. So each of these tubes has two grams of black powder in it. Then each, so for the primary, we have three of those tubes. For redundant, we have another three of those tubes. Okay, so rather than try to make them really long and put four grams in them, you're making separate charges and you're going to set them all off at the same time. They are wired in parallel, or each of those three bundles is wired in parallel. When we did the ground testing, two grams or yeah, two grams was the most reliable size that we found. The others had issues with like bolt blowing out or like breaking the the tubing. Okay, that that's an interesting way to do it. I'm going to have to make note of that because one of the, one of the issues that I have with those charges is what do you do when you get beyond two grams? Because mm -hmm. now you just start blowing out powder. And, yeah, it just wasn't it just wasn't efficient at all. So we decided. Yeah, that. yeah, that that's a good idea. I had not thought of uh, uh, using multiple charges at the same time. That's a great idea. I like that. Cool. So I have a question on that. When you ground tested this, you've got three e matches wired in parallel. Mm -hmm. You're setting off to each of them a two gram charge. Were you using the actual flight? electronics to set that off in your ground test? We had planned that. We did not get around to it. We did test it with the actual batteries we're using, and we have tested it on flight with up to three charges. Mm -hmm. And with the battery test, it was up to four charges. And and those are standard E-matches in those charges? Yes, they're yes. firewire E-matches. OK. Thank you. And what does it mean low altitude charges detonate at ambient pressure of 8 PSI? Uh, that was just to compare to what what air pressure the high altitude ones are deploying at. So we consider that the altitude, um, the 
boost Robia is not necessary to use the high altitude chargers. They're just yeah, regular vial uh chargers that we that we've standardly used and are standardly used. Okay, I'm just uh, wondering about the APSI that that's Um, I guess that's just like in comparison. So, um, but an image of what that would look like without the black powder in it is like the bottom right photo. Okay, well, on on the 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 charges on the lower right, mm -hmm. um, where where does that fail? I um, mean, what gets blown out? Does the lid get blown out? It's or you, the base it's or the whole thing. The base, yeah. The base is the area that it, it just fully shears off from what we've seen. And then the over here. And the vial itself also usually shatters, but it's I think it's the base that fails first. Okay. <laughs> I, I was I, the, my comment was about putting the E match on the top of the powder, whatever the top of the powder is. And it sounds like in those charges that it's the closer to that bulkhead where you've got the um, the wire going through, which is probably why it shatters there. So mm -hmm. that looks okay. Well, um, moving forward, here are just some photos of our separation ground tests, if you'd like to see. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead and, and run it if it'll play. That would be good. Okay. Three, two, one. Okay, and that looks pretty good. Yeah, and this is the other Three, side. Two, one. Yeah, okay, that looks good. And yeah, again, the same exact configuration has been tested in flights. So, Three, oh, two, to move forward. Three. Sorry, sometimes I play again, but yeah, moving forward to kind of like a parachute and shock cord protection. Um, we are shielding from ejection charge detonation with no mixed deployment bags and covers. Um, they are handmade for our mains and our tender descenders to protect them from um, the ejection charge detonation. Um, do you want to talk more about like the reefing ring on both of the mains? Uh, yeah, so just to just to slow the rate at which the mains inflate, we have a reefing ring, reef, reefing ring on both of them. And we've also staggered the amount of tape that we used to bundle the shot cord. So then ideally it breaks at it breaks at different times a little bit, so that spreads out the initial snatch loading. And, and yeah, the anti-zippering foam ball with a Nomex cover on a shock cord. Okay, foam ball on drogue side harness. At the tube edge, okay. Which is the picture on the lower the lower, lower right. right, yeah. Okay, I think that's that's a good idea. Uh, moving forward to our altimeter choices, our uh, primary and redundant altimeters on our booster, which con which control our recovery for our booster as well as staging, um, are the Altismetrum Easy Megas and the uh, recovery altimeters for our sustainer, which control our sustainer recovery as well as the air start mechanism, um, will be Blue Ravens. Okay, so for the staging, you're going to use the Blue Raven? No, staging is the easy, easy megas. Oh, oh, okay. Um, my terms are incorrect. Um, okay, when when you say staging, that's what's going to do the uh, explosive bolts. Mm -hmm. Is that all that you're doing to release the stage? Is the is the bolts, or is there a charge in there that pushes them apart, or a spring? There's spring mechanisms. So okay. the bolts hold the springs compressed. Got it. Okay. Okay, so you're going to use the uh, Blue Raven for staging. No, the Easy Mega for staging. The Blue Raven does the air start on the sustainer. <laughs> I still got my turn. It's back. okay. Yeah, it's uh, all good. Yeah, the air start is the Blue Raven. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and and I, I sent you a little um, uh, propaganda sheet about how to program the altimeter to do the air start. Uh, yes. We did take that into account. 
Okay, but but you you you've seen that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, if if you have any questions about the process there, please let me know. Um, the one thing on the Blue Raven uh, is that we we don't want to use the default air start that's programmed into the Raven. Yes. You would mm -hmm. use the custom programming in order to set up the the approach that I laid out. Yes. Yeah. And if you want to use a different approach than what I laid out, you can do it, but we're going to have to fight about it. <laughs> we'll let you know. I'm willing to I'm willing to listen to alternatives, but I'm going to I'm going to fight back. Currently, I think we're following your um yeah, plan to the yeah. And we also detail it on uh in a in a couple slides, I think. Okay. So. All right. So Jim, I've got to ask, why not use the default on the Blue Raven? Um I'm I'm not exactly an expert on everything that the Blue Raven does, but when I when I look at it, it appears to me that the trigger for the staging. For, for for the air start igniter is altitude. So once you reach above a certain altitude, that's sort of the trigger. And then there's also a permissive for tilt and a permissive for velocity less than. And 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 those are the numbers that are in there. Uh, and that particular program would allow a failure mechanism whereby let's say you had a uh, motor failure, and so the rocket is just drifting up, and it just barely manages to get above the trigger altitude, and it's still straight. That'll fire the igniter. So um, you, that's a failure mechanism that that we're not going to allow uh, to happen. So, so the concern is that during the sustaining the pressurization that the you exceed the the desired tilt i'm sorry run that by again so is the concern that uh under that circumstance while the sustainer motor is coming up to pressure uh the sustainer will exceed the desired tilt it's conceivable that that you could fire the igniter and and then the rocket does a 180 and goes someplace where you don't want it to go or okay yeah because i mean you know there's nothing that i mean you can literally come to a dead stop and as long as you're still pointing up and the velocity is less than the criteria you could light the motor okay thank you and and you know sometimes when you light these motors uh you know i mean it you know as in an air start mode it can take three or four seconds for it to come up to pressure uh, you know, before it goes. And so now you've got a case where you're not controlling what the sustainer is doing. Right. So the, the recommended process basically says you, you have to at least get to, you know, 70% of the expected altitude uh, before it can go. And then the other thing that the recommended process does is it says that that once you get to the condition where you want the stages to light, um, if you don't um, satisfy the permissives at that point, the window closes. So the motor can't light at a later time. Mm -hmm. and, okay. and that's what the Raven default doesn't do. Um. Yeah, uh, we definitely plan on using your programming um, instructions to the T. Um, but yeah, um, I think like in the interest of time, we'd like to kind of speed through some of these slides so you can take a look at our physical vehicle, if that's okay with you. Okay. Yeah, um, so we have axial avionics bays on either stage. Um, they have two recovery altimeters each, switches, and we are using manufacturer recommended LiPo batteries um, that are 1S. Um, this is the only area of our rocket where we use the LiPo batteries um, other than like the GPS, which is manufacturer recommended as well. Um, but yeah, we also have vent holes that are eighth inch um, near each bay and the sustainer air start circuit is shunted with a uh, DPDT switch. So.
Okay, and one one thing um, on a thirty k flight, you, you you're probably going to want some vent holes in the airframe itself. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so you'll you'll have those. Yes. Okay. Cool. Um, this is a kind of complicated sustainer wiring diagram, but um, it essentially just walks through. We have like ring terminals that kind of um, connect our um, directly from our altimeter into our like shoot uh, deployment charges. Um, and on the other side, we have like we use DT connectors and JST connectors to kind of go through our air start. Um, ignition circuit as well, um, as well as safing shunts, um, which are shown over here on either side. Did, did, did you say the shunts? I mean, is that a, um, a key switch kind of a thing? Yes. Okay. All right. Cool. Um, moving forward, our booster wiring um, kind of has a similar layout with our um, shoots on this side. So again, we have like uh, ring terminals. We are also using missile work screw switches on this side um, to arm. And then we have on the other side, our staging mechanism, our pyro bolts. So these are connected in with DT connectors. Uh, we found these to be pretty mechanically robust on our uh, flight and we have tested this. So we're pretty confident in this one as well. Um, with like test flights. Okay. Cool. Uh, moving forward to our GPS, um, we have we are currently using an egg finder GPS on both stages. We also have SRAD um, um, GPS on both stages currently. Um, so we have four GPSs in total, two on each stage. Um, they are at 915 megahertz frequencies, adjustable, and are activated remotely with SRAD Bluetooth switches. Okay. Um, there, there's a, a now, okay, um, for the Bluetooth switches, now that is uh, what through a, a phone app or something like that, or, or what what is what is that um it's kind of just through like we have our own um microcontroller that will be sending a signal through long uh laura mod um communication um to our rocket yeah. okay i i think it's okay mm -hmm. um, but just if, if you were a single stage rocket you wouldn't be allowed to do that the they're they're really not allowing um, any Bluetooth or Wi-Fi switches to be used at all, uh, except for the two stages can use Wi-Fi switches. Yeah, so, we totally understand. It's just like a hazard for us to go up that high. Um, we think, and we can't really find good ladders um, on our end, but we're gonna try to get one just in case, anyways. Well, that, that raises a good question. Um, how are you planning to aim uh, to arm the sustainer electronic? Because they will, will be high. Yes, so currently we do have our own ladder that um, will be able to reach our sustainer electronics. Which is lower than where the GPS would be. Yeah, and it is much lower from where the GPS would be. So that's why we're specifically using the Bluetooth switches for the GPS. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Uh, moving forward into our active staging mechanism. So these are the explosive bolts um, where they compress the springs until we stage. Um, and there are aluminum walls that you see over here that are installed around each bolt. And um, that's basically a hard stop to avoid surpassing the critical compression distance of the springs and also protect the wiring from uh, that is gonna be located around here from the shrapnel of the bolt exploding. Um, we've had a lot of success with this. We've flown this on like this type of mechanism um, on four flights, um, actually no, three flights total, if including like our prototype launches. So we had two prototype launches with um, not the exact same mechanism, but a very, very similar mechanism. And um, we've flown this successfully as well. Um, and we've tested it like a bajillion times as well. Yeah, and we have a video of this uh, ground test right here. 
you'd like to see, so. I'm recording. Okay, fire in the hole. Three, two, one, and. Yes. I'm recording. Oops, sorry. Fire in the hole. Yeah. Okay, so that, that was the explosive bolts re releasing? Yeah. Okay, so show me in the diagram. Um, I mean, what, what I'm looking for on a staging interstage coupler is like at least something that's like one caliber long that's keeping the stages from moving against each other. Um, yes, um, we do have that and we can show it to you on our actual vehicle, um, but it is one caliber long, correct? Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah. So that is um that is met. Yeah. So that coupler is one caliber long and it holds the stages together with those uh three bolts, those um yeah, springs that are compressed. Um, but yeah. Um this is just kind of talking through exactly how these explosive bolts are made. Um we've gone through a lot of iterative processes with these to get them to the point where um they're uh they work extremely well for us. So um yeah, we've done FEA analysis, tensile strength analysis, as well as ground testing on these. Um, yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, to move forward into kind of like our air start delays and conditions and like staging, kind of like what is our like methodology behind this? Um, so we do experience booster burnout at around four seconds, which is the burn time of the O5500 motor. Um, we want to minimize our tilt angle during the coast while maximizing our apogee. So uh, we stayed one second after booster burnout, um, and this has been simulated, um, and air start five seconds after staging. So our conditions for air start are listed here, as well as our conditions for staging. Um, and yeah, would people want to add any particular um, kind of notes to this? And this is kind of like also based off of um, the guidelines recommended as well. Yeah, the, the only thing I see on there is is it looks like you've got a, a window from five to 10 seconds where you could fire the air start. Um, no, sorry. So the five seconds is five seconds after staging and we stage five seconds into flight. So that's a total of 10 seconds into flight is when we air start. So we stage, we air start five seconds after staging and we stage five seconds after flight. So that's why we want to be at least 10 seconds into flight before we air start. That makes sense. So like if we go start from zero seconds, we get oh, five. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. For, for whatever reason, I, you know, I must be a newbie at staging. <laughs> I, I hear the, hear the term staging and I see an igniter. So I'm just trying to just the, the nomenclature. Like I, I would refer to it as stage separation and staging mm -hmm. rather than staging and air start, but it, it's just something I have to watch for. So, okay. So I think I understand all that. And I would just say, you know, it looks like you've got maybe a half a second window, right? 10 seconds to 10.5. Into flight, um, yes. Yeah, it yeah. says at least 10 uh, seconds, yeah. less than 10.5. Yeah, and our reasoning behind this small window is because we predict that it will take at least two to three seconds for the 1939 to light and allow for pressure to build up. So we don't want to go too far, make our window too big because our sims show that if we go past a certain delay time, then our, our apogee falls off really quickly. So we, we would rather be more conservative in our, or we'd rather have a smaller time frame than have a larger time frame. Okay, yeah, the, the recommendations actually have even a shorter window, like 10 to 10.2. Mm -hmm. and, and really the only number that's important is, well, they're both important. The larger number, like if I gave you an example, I said 10 and 10.2. The larger number, 10.2, is where you would evaluate your altitude check. So mm -hmm. you would say, okay, at 10.2 seconds, I'm going to be at altitude X. 
And so my altitude check is 70% of X, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so if, if you know at, at exactly 10.2 seconds, you would say, what's my simulated altitude? Uh, and then one of your criteria is that the altitude has to be greater than 70% of that. And it looks like you're pretty close. Uh, you, you know, 5,000 and you have the altitude of 7,200. So that's pretty close. Uh, the key thing is just that those numbers are evaluated at the end of the time window, the 10.2. Mm -hmm. And then you pick a second number, a little lower number, maybe 10 seconds. Uh, and, and that may well be where the igniter fires, because if you're anywhere close to a nominal flight, you'll be above the altitude check value. So my, my point is the, the window can be pretty, pretty tight. You know, Smart. a couple yeah. of a second is enough to, uh, uh, you know, to set those criteria. Got it. Yeah, we will definitely keep that in mind. Um, from our test flights, um, our Pinkberry was called our like, prototype for this vehicle. Um, we really learned that we needed to simple, have a simple wiring harness without like a lot of like wiring on the pad. It was, it was kind of like an integration mess on the pad for us in particular, because this was our first stage, uh, vehicle as a team. Um, and we really validated our bolt design um, and our staging mechanism in the prototype um, and also the need to make like staging walls to protect our wiring throughout flight was learned through this prototype. Um, during the test flights of our full vehicle today, um, we kind of realized that the um, keeping the main inside the chute was an issue, which we talked about, as well as um, needing to conduct more rigorous ground testing and pull apart testing. Um, to kind of really proof our recovery system, uh, validating our air start circuit, anti-zippering mechanisms, determining motor ignition timing and ignition delays, as well as like redundancy on the tender to center. So um, we've learned a lot throughout a lot of this, um, a lot of these test flights. And honestly, like um, test flying has been like the biggest thing for us to actually get like, um, like lessons to learn out of our vehicle build and stuff like that. Okay, we, yeah, it's, it's good with the out the top deployment to have that anti zippering on there because that's sort of the, you know, one of the Achilles heels of the, of that method is that, you know, the drogue comes out and catches and then it zippers the top of the tube. And, and particularly if you have some horizontal velocity. Mm -hmm. So, you know, anything that you can do to help protect against zippering uh, is a good thing. Totally. Yeah. Um, just because we're running really short on time, I'm going to speed through a little bit of the payload because I think this is the majority of like the vehicle that you were probably interested in. Is that? Yeah, okay? I'm really not too concerned about the payload other than it stays in the rocket. Yeah, it stays in the rocket. It's not going anywhere. <laughs> it does a good job staying put in the rocket. Um, yeah, but you, essentially, you yeah. Uh, yeah, you don't want it to be moving around. Uh, yeah. Totally. Yeah. Um, but yeah, a little bit about our payload before we move on. It's a, it, it's a life support experiment. Um, so it's um, the idea is, is how can we keep like an organ oxygenated through space travel or um, through a rocket? Um, so we have kind of like a simulation of this where we have a PDMS membrane, which represents a cell membrane and we keep it oxygenated or in this case carbonated and uh, measure our carbon dioxide levels throughout flight and see whether um, actual like um, diffusion of gases are happening throughout flight. So it's, it's a pretty cool payload and we've had a great time building it. Um, it's integrated into the payload tube on a removable bulkhead with 1024 screws and remote activation um, on the pad. It powers on the electronics several, um, like, a, like a while before launch. Um, and it is, the majority of the structure is composed of aluminum and T-rails. This payload has test flown twice on both of our test flights, and it's done a pretty good job um, of remaining very structurally stable. We've had issues with data collection on the second flight, but on the first flight, we got some um, cool data out of it as well. So uh, we plan on fully running this payload at competition, and it um, meets all the weight requirements. It runs on a uh, Lion battery. Um, it does not run on LiPo batteries, um, but this is some images and quick tests. But um, essentially, it uh, we have a pump that mimics a heart that's um, pumping an oxygenated fluid, or sorry, a carbonated fluid. We're using carbon dioxide instead of oxygen because it's easier for us. 
um, throughout the system or like the circulatory system and the PDMS membrane. These are our cell membranes down here in the blue and it kind of interacts with the atmosphere to see whether we can continue oxygenation at different accelerations and altitudes. So um, it's a super cool payload. Okay. Um, overall, we just realized that we need to have a more secure avionics system on it because um, there were some leaks, but um, we have figured our way around that and um, are manufacturing our last iteration current. Um, moving on to our SRAD avionics, we have... Do, do, do these do any deployment, the SRAD? Um, the SRAD avionics are not wired to any energetics throughout our vehicle. Um, it is kind of like a theory. Um, in in theory, one day we hope to kind of fly it, um, but this is, we are using it just for data logging as well as GPS currently. Yeah, and we probably don't need to talk about it too much then. Yeah, um, but it's a pretty cool eight layer PCB that is telemega form factor, uh, but with more sensors and it took us a long time to make and it was really cool. So um, we're having a good, it's, it's really complicated. Um, it's it's again really complicated, um, but um, it also activates our air brakes and runs a control algorithm in flight to um, activate our air brakes. We have a variety of sensors, including barometers, coarse and fine accelerometers, um, IMUs with accelerometers and gyroscopes as well, um, and triple redundancy on every single sensor, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, we have magnetometers, data logging. We've run multiple test flights overall and are super excited to fly it at comp. Um, here's some of the data we've actually, uh, that matches up to our um, POTS systems as well. Um, and we are e easily able to like reduce noise through like common filtering. Um, and yeah, this is also more of that. Um, but I guess the last major thing I wanna to touch on is air brakes. Uh, we have an actively controlled air brake system, which we run a lot of um, ANSYS and Simulink simulations on to determine the exact amount of drag and apogees that um, will be hit throughout our flight. Um, we have, uh, we just had our, I guess, first successful flight of our air brakes. However, we didn't necessarily see it because um, on our onboard camera footage, because um, our like uh, air start didn't work. Um, but yeah, overall it weighs around six pounds and um, this is the mechanism, a ball screw on the inside rotates the flaps outwards um, and it's all controlled by a stepper motor and the avionics are um, sit right on top of the such stepper motor. Um, okay, so just, oh, okay, that, that I was going to ask about the control of it. Um, yeah. Um, this is our control algorithm. This is probably not a good um, way to kind of learn about what a control algorithm does, but I can kind of explain it from like a larger picture. We have um, barometers that detect our altitude and we're actively calculating our velocity and acceleration throughout flight. We're taking that data in and we have downloaded like uh, are like kind of like stored pre-trained models on our microcontroller that is essentially going to match up our uh, live data with the right model and then determine the exact time to deploy our air brakes at um, to reach 30,000 feet exactly. Because our simulations are so close to 30,000 feet, we're at 30,107 feet, we expect to deploy air brakes only for 0 0.5 seconds at the very last second of our flight. So um, it's just gonna be forward, it's just gonna go like this <laughs> at the very end um, of our flight. Uh, we wanted to overshoot more with our vehicle so we could have, have some nice videos also of our air brakes deploying and really make use of the very cool technology that we built. But um, right now it's at uh, the last 0 0.5 seconds. Um, so that's last one second, but it takes um, 0 0.2, like, 3 seconds for it to deploy to the right angles and back in. But yeah, does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Um, it's um this is just about the avionics behind it this is all student manufactured and created uh, as well as our like motors our sensor integration um we've had to add heat sinks because the um the computation behind it, it's like very intensive and it's real and the stepper motor driver is going through a lot of power consumption as well so we have to like cool it down 
um, during flight as well. But other than that, uh, we're done with our slides and can answer any questions before we get, do a final walkthrough of our rocket. Um, well, let, let's let's start the walkthrough, and there's there's a couple more topics that that I'll raise as we do that. But uh, let, let's just you know, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure there's too much that I need to see on the upper part of the sustainer. Okay. Um, um, now we're getting down to the air brakes. Okay. Um, let's let's they, about, uh, about the wiring. Now let me let me see. Let me. Uh, okay, you're not minimum diameter. So how are how are you bringing the igniter signal down to the motor? Yeah, that's a really great question. So. Um... Joe, if you want to move the camera over here, are you seeing our spotlight video on Zoom? So if you pin Joseph, that'll be the camera. I think I have. Yeah. Oh, oh I think you have to do Yeah. Um, do you see it currently? I'm I'm seeing the bottom of the rocket. Yeah. Awesome. So this is um we have wire conduits that run through our um section of the tube. And these wire conduits, this is an example right here of how the wire conduits kind of like run through. Um, and they're on the other side. Okay, so you 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 just need a way of protecting those wires from your bolts. Yeah, yeah. So um, we will be like kind of insulating them, but this is like an aluminum wire conduit, correct? Okay, are are you going to be able to do the all up test on the igniter? I think so because we have the shunt. Yes, we do think so because we do have the shunt. I don't know if you heard that. Well, the what what the all up test is is you would take the sustainer, and and you would basically turn everything on, uh, just as you would when you're launching the rocket except that the igniter is not in the motor. Um, we can do that if we essentially have like a resistor or a piece of wire like mocking our igniter in. Well, you would actually have the igniter hooked up to it, but it would just be outside of the rocket. Um, I guess we can if we no. like stick it out. There's nowhere for it to go out when it's vertical. Yeah, we, oh yeah, we can't do it when it's vertical, no. Yeah, the, the idea would be, well, I mean, the idea is to tr try to do it exactly as you would do it in the actual setup and preparing for launch. So, you know, some things might be turned on horizontal, some things might be turned on vertical. Uh, and uh, I'm a big proponent of doing that because it's sort of your your last line of defense uh, to, to make sure that you don't inadvertently light the sustainer motor. And, and uh, I, I've gone so far as to actually make um, some jigs so that I can set the rocket vertical without being, you know, without resting on the wires or interfering with any of the wiring at the bottom of the motor. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, for example, if you had a one inch P or a, a one foot diameter piece of PVC, you could set your sustainer on on that, uh, and you know you wouldn't be interfering with the wires. Um, we've had that in the past with our previous prototype, but we're advised against it because of the weight of our vehicle. Um, but if we do think that we should be doing that, we can definitely get that done as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you, I, I think it's a really good idea if you can negotiate the logistics of it to, to do a test at the pad where you go through the process that you're going to do to actually load and arm the rocket and, and you just do it with the sustainer not or with the igniter not in the motor. And then you turn everything off and just repeat that process again mm -hmm. with the igniter in the motor. Okay. Yeah, we will definitely keep that 
Um, and like, there's probably a way that we can do it with a jig or something like that to make sure that that's um, like, that's something we can do. Um, yeah, I mean, like I say, I mean, you know, the, the, the thing you have to be careful about with two stage rockets is inadvertently lighting the sustainer on the pad. And, and nobody ever thinks it's going to happen, but two or three times a year it launches, it does happen. And it can be, a you know, it's a real problem if it does. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, you've, you've got the shunt and the switches on there, um, you know, which hopefully will prevent that from happening. But, it, but, but that dry run just before you get ready to, to launch is really useful for avoiding that sustainer from lighting inadvertently. So give it some thought, and if it's something you think you can do, uh, you know, give it a shot. Um, it's something that we could definitely do if we were allowed to go vertical and back down horizontal and then vertical again. Well, I mean, you, you can do this on, you know, before it ever gets to the rail. Um, okay. I mean, if, it, if it's just the sustainer, I mean, you... Um, you know, if there, there's some things that you would turn on while it's horizontal, perhaps, and then then you can just manually take it to vertical, mm -hmm. sitting on the ground, and and do the arming. Okay, that's definitely noted, and we'll include that in our procedures accordingly and try to make it work. Yeah. Yeah, I I, I really recommend it. I mean, I, I I can show you pictures. I mean, I'm sitting out in the desert with, you know large stage rockets like this and I'm doing that all up test because I have be situations where yeah mm -hmm. yeah okay um just, just to be clear if if they need to go vertical to do the all up test they should not be holding the rocket manually themselves they either need uh a, a, a short pad or uh, a jig or some way to hold the rocket. So just in case the motor goes off, there's not people that are going to get injured. Yeah, I, we can make a stand to hold it vertical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, on the all-up test, the igniter is not in the motor. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's right. That's right. So uh, scratch that. By the yeah. way, the weight is definitely like in, it's not safe for people on ladders to be holding up weight as well. So we'll definitely design a jig for that. Okay. Um, and so um, as far as the igniter goes, what are you going to use for your igniter? Um, our igniters are custom made. So they have three heads on um, either of them. And each of those igniter heads are it's basically like APCP Blue Thunder with um, two E matches inserted into each head with some black powder as well to help it catch. And it's all like taped and epoxied together. Um, and it's uh, like run down and wired up parallel on, okay. on a stick. And the stick goes into the motor. We're making sure that it's like um, at, at the right like placement as well and secured. Um, Okay, so you you don't really need to cover your nozzle because you're not using a, a black powder separation charge. Um, no, but we kind of do with duct tape anyway, just to secure our ignition mechanism in um, on the day of launch. Okay, yeah. um, one one concept that I will pass along to you: mm -hmm. uh, the the trick for getting sustainer motors lit. Uh, and it will be particularly the case for for the way that you're doing it, is that you have to keep the stick in the in the motor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a stand that like kind of clips into the bottom of the nozzle, and we're securing it to the bottom of the nozzle as well. So. Okay. Yeah, and and the trick is that the the way that you hold the igniter in, you can't block the entire nozzle. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. what, what you don't want to, like, like just as an example, um, some people will put the stick in there and then they'll put the red cap on as a, as a way of holding the stick in. Mm -hmm. And what happens is the igniter fires and it just blows the cap off and spits the igniter. Yeah, we have holes in our, um, like, kind of ignition retainer um, to prevent that from happening as well. Okay, yeah. The secret is to keep the stick in there for 
Well, it, with the Blue Thunder, you need to keep it in a little bit longer uh, mm -hmm. than, than other methods. Yeah, um, that's but, true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, but you, you wanna you wanna make sure that the, the that when that igniter is firing, that it's not gonna get spit out. Totally. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's let's take a quick look at the the interstage coupler. That's what I wanted to see before, and it was a little difficult. So maybe just. Um, so yeah, this is our interstage body tube, the white tube, and this is kind of like our um, this coupler that goes into like either side of it. So this coupler is going on this side, and this coupler is going on this side. Um, looking into this, we have. Let, let me let me ask you a question. Does does the does does is the sustainer going to fly as it's shown right now? With is it is it going to be just like that? Okay, and where where does the motor go to? Um, the motor goes up until here. Like the retainer sticks out a little, but it's fine. Okay, so it's right at that point. Okay, so that coupler that's sticking out—that's your staging coupler. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Yeah. Um, inside of our like stage separation tube, we have our lower staging ring. Um, and this ring kind of compressing well, right, um, against this ring to kind of have our bolts hold in our springs. Did okay. I get that right? Our springs kind of sit over here and our bolts go in here. Okay. This is where our springs go. Um, and then on this side is essentially our um, ab bay with our pressure shield. And then over here is where it separates. Um, shear pins are on this side for the recovery system. Okay, and uh, most of the teams so far have been showing me their fins by putting the fin can on the ground and standing on the rocket. Yeah, we could do that. <laughs> I don't mean you have to do it. Uh, it's surprising though, people have been doing it and it's been working. I'm not sure I would do that on. Yeah, on mine, yeah, but, can, uh, uh, yeah this is lofted. Yeah, this is uh, three layer tip to tip glassing. Up there on our uh, sustainers, five layer tip to tip glassing. It's, uh, this one survived uh, two test flights. And again, recovery wasn't nominal. Um, and that one survived as well with like a hard landing where recovery was not nominal. Um, so. We're, we're pretty okay with the way our things are looking, but we okay. Can... And uh, have we talked about the stability of the two stages? Um, I don't think we have, but we can talk about it right now. Yeah, let's let's uh, let's do that. Okay. Um. So we can mark out. Um. Basically, this is our center of pressure. Um. And our center of gravity is over here on the safe separation mechanism center of gravity. Um, so yeah, center of gravity here, center of pressure there. Um, okay, just, just tell me the two calibers of stability. Um, so for the full vehicle, it is, um, what is it again? Um, it's on our slides. Um, I'll pull it up. Uh, Stephen or Matthew, do you have it on the top of your head? I know this sustainer is. Uh, it's just the uh, full vehicle is 2.09. And then okay. stainer is 1.62. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, 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 just a, a question if you happen to know the answer. Uh, it surprises me that the sustainer is 1.6, given that the fins are, you know, the spin span is greater than the, the uh, diameter of the body and because the weight of the payload is on top. Um, it, 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 is it weight at the bottom of the rocket that's bringing the stability down? Or? The air brakes mechanism is located lower in the rocket. And in general, like our, um, like our booster tube weighed a lot more than we thought it would. Um, we did not place enough ballast in our nose cone early on. Um, and we kind of 
only measured out the weights. Um, this is the weights of uh, like, this is after we waved out, we weighed out every tube in the rocket, calculated the CG of every tube and then calculated it by like extrapolating it. So um, we, we've we gone through a lot of rigor and like figuring this number out too. But um, yeah, it's essentially like from our open rocket, like our weights did not match our design. Essentially, um, it was heavier. I was more bottom heavy than we thought it would with the air brakes mechanism. Okay. Yeah. Um, let me just run through my my checklist here and see totally. if I have any other questions. Okay, I had one. Um, going back to the interstage coupler, mm -hmm. um, once the um, once once the uh, sustainer separates, uh, is is there a bulkhead protecting the electronics, or how's how is the protecting our recovery electronics on our booster stage, or are you talking yes. about? Oh yeah, so that is the pressure shield we were talking about. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. but it is removable. Yeah, it's essentially a removable bulkhead. Okay. And uh, with the O5500, what what are you looking at for rail velocity? Our off the rail velocity is around a hundred and five feet per second, a hundred and one feet per second. So it is very close um, to the mark. Yeah. Okay. Um, on the bottom of the sustainer, um, tell me how the motor thrust is applied um, to the airframe. Um, we have several centering rings as well as the thrust plate at the bottom, uh, which is basically our, uh, which is distributing our thrust and supporting our motor. Okay, so the, the motor pushes on the thrust ring, mm -hmm. and but the, the thrust ring doesn't push on the bottom of the airframe, or does it? Um, it pushes outside on the walls of our airframe, I think. Um, Stephen and Matthew can also add on to that. So yeah, um, the thrust ring at the bottom like uh, distributes the force from our motor onto like oh, our body tube. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so they're epoxy to the motor mount tube and then to the yeah. side of the body tube. Yeah. So there's a fillet, epoxy fillet on both sides. Yeah. And there's four, five? There's, there's five centering, there's four centering rings as well as the, uh, and at the bottom it's like the, yeah. Okay, so your motor tube will be um connected to the five centering rings yeah and all of those centering rings are glued in and you also have the pin tabs there yeah yeah uh, and then the motor is then pushing on the motor tube yeah okay and that and yeah it's at the very end uh, like we have rings at the very end to, yeah. yeah like the thrust plate is at the very end which we we expect most of the force to be on a thrust plate rather than like all the centering rings, but they're there for extra support as well. Okay, and what is the thrust plate? Um, it's like quarter inch aluminum. Or... Same, yeah. yeah, quarter inch aluminum. Just and and that's right. attached to the airframe with screws. Um, it's permanent. That's epoxy. Yeah, it's permanent. Okay, so that that's an, an aluminum thrust plate, and you fill it above that. Yes. Um. Yeah. And okay. we tried to do an internal fillet. We just like flooded it with epoxy before we like put it in. I think. Yeah. Okay. Why isn't the thrust through the centering rings? I mean, we expect most of the. I mean, we do have thrust through our centering rings as well. We just expect 
like a significant amount to be placed at the end of the motor as well, because that's where um, we have our exhaust velocity coming in. Okay. Yeah. It's more because it's, the... it's, it's better if you can say that it's transferred through both mechanisms. Yeah, it's it's it is transferred through both mechanisms. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And then on the bottom of the rocket, is there a thrust plate pushing on the airframe? Mm -hmm. We can show that as well. Um, Joe, do you want to grab the camera? I think I probably saw it, but. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, the booster section, the end of there. Okay, I, I do not. Uh, okay, that is pushing on the bottom of the airframe. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, okay. I don't have any other questions. Um, do you have any? Um, do we have any questions throughout the team? Anyone? Can we double check that egg timers are okay? Um, we just want to double check that egg timers are okay for flight. Um, well, there's they are they are okay. Uh, they're supposed to have been flown. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, egg finders. We're not using egg timers. Egg finders. My bad. For the GPS. For the GPS. Yeah. You know, I I think so. Um, I I I think I think with uh, it, it it used to be they said well you have to have the GPS that can be acquired by the uh, by the Defingi trailer and 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 it was sort of confounded. Now I think they only require that you have GPS before you fly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, yeah, we, yeah, we just wanted to double check, but yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, I, I think so. I mean, it wouldn't hurt just to read through the requirements one more time, but I think that they are okay. Okay, that sounds good. Um, and as far as schedule goes, it's going to be similar to last year, correct? With launch days on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Uh, yeah, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Okay. Now, um, the one thing that I've been telling the teams is that, um, you know, last year they flew rockets um, in too much wind. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you were there, you know, it was really windy. Yeah, it was pretty bad. Our vehicle definitely suffered. Yeah. Yeah. And and there there was some extra visibility of that by spaceport people and by Tripoli management and so forth. And so that's not going to happen this year. Um, there, there's going to be a lot of scrutiny to the wind conditions. And, you know, ESRA actually went through a process of calculating, uh, you know, where to aim the launch rails under certain wind conditions and blah, blah, blah. And, and they had to do all that just to get a 30K waiver. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of scrutiny on 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 the wind direction and velocity and so forth. Uh, and so what that means is that the the two stages need to fly in the morning before the wind comes up. Got it. Yeah. Well, our goal is to be on the pad Wednesday morning, and we did that last year with our. I know a lot of teams say that, but we did that last year too with our 10k vehicle. But we had to scratch multiple times because of high winds. So yeah, all time. the teams, you know, probably a couple dozen of them that that I've flown at Spaceport, uh, they all say we're going to launch early in the morning on the first. <laughs> we pinky promise. Yeah. <laughs> and guess what? None of them have ever done it. <laughs> we'll we'll be the first. We'll think you probably well, that would that would be true. I mean, there was one that was maybe within an hour of actually being when they said, mm -hmm. um, but most of the others missed it by one or two days and by six or eight hours. Uh, so uh, what I my my point is what I want to encourage you to do is to develop a really good checklist so that you're able to get the rocket out. And, and you're not running into things that you didn't anticipate uh, in the process of getting it out there. Uh, and the, the other thing I would recommend is that you look at who's got what parts, uh, because I can't tell you how many times, uh, you know, we've 
got there and well, how come you're not out here? Well, you know, Joe has the computer for this. He's not here yet. And, you know, and Bob has the tool and he's in Las Cruces and, you know, that kind of stuff just kills you. Um, you know, when, when you distribute out the parts to people and you don't know for sure, um, you know, they're, they're not there when they need to be. So, you know, kind of look at that part of it too and make sure you've got everything bundled and, and ready where you need it. Uh, and the other thing I think they're going to allow, uh, they may allow the, the two stage teams and the hybrid teams to have somebody stay overnight at Spaceport. Uh, and the, the idea is just to help teams get a jump start so that they can launch earlier in the day. Great. We'll be there all that long. <laughs> yeah, and I'll, I'll, I, I haven't yet confirmed that, that mm -hmm. they're actually going to allow that. But when I do, I'll let everyone know um, that, uh, about that situation. Because, you know, very seriously, if, you know, if we, if we apply those rules this year and we have the weather that we had last year, there will be teams that don't fly. And so you don't want to be one of those teams. You want to be ready to go in the morning uh, while the wind's down and not run into the problems with the weather. Just to confirm, do you uh, know if 8 a.m. is still the time that the launch waiver starts? You know, I'm I'm not sure. Um, I, I think I think the, the 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 waiver could open as early as, as six in the morning. Okay. Um, the, the problem is last year they ran into, you know, they lost some waiver time to White Sands. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we remember um, they were doing some testing so they had to stop launches for a while. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, those things can come up and, you know, I don't know, but, but I, but I can tell you that everyone involved is committed to trying to get things open and ready to go as early as possible. Oh. Yeah. Uh, and so to the extent that it's in the control of those folks, um, you know, it'll, it'll be, it'll be an early thing. Um, so I'm hoping that's what will happen because if it's not, you know, we're going to run into those weather issues. So I just, just urge you to, to, you know, do more planning than you might otherwise do, uh, for the purpose of planning to get out so that, you know, within a, a couple hours after you arrive, you're on the pad and ready to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, thank you for all the advice. We really appreciate you taking the time to talk to our team and giving us detailed feedback on a lot of our portions as well. And we so very quickly, uh, Jim, just just to be clear, uh, do you consider them to have passed the video review and okay to proceed to the competition? Yeah, um, I, I actually was just going to give a little bit of thought to what we decided needed to change, if anything. Uh, and, you know, there's still a few things like you need to get me the altimeter program uh, that, you know, that, that fits with everything. So I know what that is. Um, we talked about considering the size of the drogue shoots and so forth. Uh, so I don't recall that there's anything that, that I would say that, that you're not clear. There's still some things to think about, um, but, um, but, but I think you're, but, but you're, you're, your, your past in the sense of the review. Okay, does that make sense? Thank you, <laughs> yeah. Now, do you know uh, how many two-stage teams there are this year? Um, well, there's a few that are vacillating between two-stage and single-stage. Uh, you know, yeah, but so we'll, we'll kind of see. Um, but there's probably not more than 12. Um, and and uh, ho hopefully they'll all get there. Um, but it, it might be 10, it might be 12. I, I know we, we, I, I'm only aware that we've lost one team uh, so far, and we actually acquired a two stage. So we may be sitting at around 12 at this point. Okay. And will you be running the two stage pads again this year? It's possible. Um, <laughs> I'm planning to. Um, and, you know, the one, the one thing, you know, is, 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 you know, Paul sitting out there. Um, you know, we can allow the teams to have more time out there uh, at the two stage pads than what you would have at the single stage pads. So, you know, at the single stage pads, everyone, you know, on your marks, get set, go, and everybody goes out and loads up and evacuates and so forth. Uh, at the two stage pads, you know, you can spend a little bit more time out there, um, you know, doing things like inserting igniters and doing all up tests and 
you know, getting everything integrated. You, you may have to leave for a launch and then come back, but you can leave stuff out there, you know, so that you can almost, you know, you, you can almost like you set up a tent out there where you can have a, you know, instead of doing it in the parking lot, you can do it down in the two stage area. So it's okay to actually bring a table to the two stage pads? Bring a what? A table. Oh yeah, yeah, you can bring a table, you can bring a tent and you can set up, you know, just like you were out in the parking lot because it's, it's gonna take more time to set it up and, and you can't do a lot of it in the parking lot. So, you, you know, you can bring it down there and, you know, I suspect we'll probably have teams, you know, staggered every 50 feet or whatever it is, you know, setting up their rockets. And it may be that if someone's ready to launch that we have to leave and then come back, but you can leave everything there. Okay. Do you know it would be the same two uh, launch pads that were there last year? Um, I don't know for sure. Um, it's entirely possible that those same two crappy pads will be there. Uh, there's a there's a trailer mounted pad with a hydraulic lift that we may get. Oh, nice. I, ho I hope we do. That has a twenty foot rail on it, and then we don't have to screw around trying to lift those really heavy. Uh, rails which is a pain so right. I'm, I'm hoping we have that but uh, you know this is one of those things that i don't have direct control over and kind of what shows up is going to be what i get so you know the you, you kind of have to assume you've got a you know a 17 foot rail and a you know a tony pad uh like at the single stage but you know we may have those rails we used last year and we may have that trailer mode. you know we'll just see we were and, wondering if there any chance if we could bring a rail extension but as our off the rail velocity would be a lot higher if we just had like a bit longer rail. We do understand that this could possibly be seen as unfair to other teams though. So. Well, I mean, they, they generally kind of frown. I mean, I've asked that question before, um, sure. you know, when teams were marginal, can they bring a rail extension? And, and the answer that I've gotten, whether it's considered or not, is that they don't really want you to do that. Uh, but those two rails are 20 feet. You know, any of the rails that we have, if it's the ones we used last year, would be 20 feet. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I'll, I'll ask you what what your final calculated velocity is. And, and if you told me it was 80 feet, I'd say, okay, we got to wait for no wind. Uh, if you're pretty close to the, the 100, um, you know, if you were above 90, I'm not going to worry too much about it. Yeah, we're above 100, but just like barely, so. Yeah, I mean, 100 is a fast velocity. Mm -hmm, that is true. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a long story as to how some of these numbers have gotten into the DTAG. That's one I wish they would change. Um, I'm more interested in seeing the 8Gs, um, you know, thrust to weight ratio initially. Uh, and if you've got that, I'm okay with it. Um, you know, then the step two is to not have the, the lower two buttons too far apart. Uh, and then, you know, hopefully none of that becomes important if you're launching early enough in the morning where there's not a lot of wind. Mm -hmm. That's really important for the two stage. I mean, last year we were launching two stage rockets in the afternoon. The wind was blowing 20 miles an hour. And, and you know, I, I'm not doing that this year. We had parts falling down on other pads and we had one rocket that, I mean, the sustainer didn't even light and it landed on the other side of the flight line. Uh, and, and so we're just not going to do that this year. So I'm, I'm just telling every team, you just have to be ready to fly in the morning. You just have to be. Got it. Yeah. And Jim, will you be doing the flight safety checks for the two stages? Uh, uh, there's so many of them that I wouldn't count on it. Uh, I don't know. Okay. I don't think it's probably practical that, that I can do them all. Yeah, uh, you know, I'm, and and to some extent, I'm I'm okay with other people doing it, um, but I'll do as many of them as I can. Okay, well, I uh, I contacted uh, our RSO and let them know I wanted to do flight safety checks again this year. So I'll probably see you in the convention center. Well, you're you're welcome to pony up to the two stage table if you'd like, because I'm not sure that I've really got any um, volunteers at the moment. I'm happy to to do whatever they want me to. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're gonna need some help at the pad. My my knees don't let me get around very well. 
Um, yeah, um, I think I may even be getting out there Sunday early enough to help set up some pads if necessary. Okay, yeah, that that'd be good. Yeah, because the 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 way they're talking about aiming these pads, I'm not sure, you know, what the setup is going to look like on those things. So uh, I can use all the help I can get um, early on because I'll probably be out there Sunday as well trying to you know, figure out how to set up whatever I'm given. Okay. All right. Well, it looks like a good project. We're looking forward to, to getting the two stages to work this year. We didn't have any of them that were completely successful last year, so I'm more optimistic this year. Thank you. Do you have any questions uh, between now and then, Holler? Uh, let's let's trade a few pieces of data that we talked about. But other than that, uh, I'll plan to see you there. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. You bet. Thank, Thank you. you. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.